good, good morning. Welcome, welcome to Matinair on Air. Jane Matinair, Greg Bach, Calvin Butenoff coming to you from our studio in downtown Waukesha. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous day. You mm-hmm. have the chance to get outside, take a, take your lunch outside, go Sounds for a little good. walk. Sounds good. See ya. Not you, not yet. We have an hour to go. <laughs> Calvin, you're staying here too. Um, I want to thank again uh, retired Major General Randy Manor yes. for joining us in the previous half hour. That will be a podcast if you would like to share it with someone, please, or there's someone you think should listen to it, mm-hmm. just go to civicmedia.us, click on shows, go to Matt Nair on air, and that will take you to all of the shows since the beginning. <laughs> since the all, beginning. All, all, archived, all archived there. And uh, yeah, I think, I just think it's a really important discussion and we're going to keep having this discussion because people do not appreciate, I don't think, the severity of what this would mean for all of us. Yeah. Regardless of, of how you vote, this would have wide, wide ramifications for all of us. And something that I don't want to No, you know, I'm just going to sound alarmist. I'm just going to do it for those out there who think, Oh, this isn't a big deal. You're being over dramatic. You may be right to a certain degree that the foreign president getting a second shot at the presidency might not affect you immediately. But as Randy said, this would take about two years. To and be that's able- really fast. Yep. And, and and you may agree with the president at the time. Like, if you agree with Trump. But as we've seen before, he has a predilection towards turning his back on people and, and individuals who all of a sudden have shunned him or disagree with him. And you don't even know it. So... Just remember, just because they're not pointing the finger at you now doesn't mean they won't be pointing the finger at you later down the road. And you might not like Joe Biden or liberals or, you know, even the rhinos. They're still going to try to preserve the democracy that we are used to. It's not the best democracy. We can definitely work on this republic. But it's not going to be the life altering shift that's going to happen. If pres- And I don't like being alarmist. I don't like doing this. But everything points to it because we're listening to him talk. With 36 years of experience in the military. No, I'm saying we're listening to Trump talk. Oh, to Trump, yeah. No, 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 no. What What Randy Manor said. What Randy Manor said is true. What Steve Anderson said is very true. And I even want to like just really quick go back uh, to the original gentleman we had uh, a few months ago in in February, I believe. uh, All saying the same thing. All more importantly, uh, uh, Admiral Smith, Jeff Admiral, Smith, Jeff, Jeff Smith. That's right. But more importantly, we're listening to the words of Donald Trump. He is saying these things, the people around him. So it's not us making it up. It's not us twisting the truth. It's not us making you trying to make you scared. He is saying this is going to happen. It's all it read project 2025. Yes. Seriously. We'll put a link into the show notes. Yeah. It's a long read. It's, it's 900 pages long. Not the best written thing either. Well, yeah. Is it scintillating? I'm not sure. <laughs> scintillating, um, but uh, it's definitely worth it's definitely worth looking at and uh, and learning more about. Yeah, because this is the plan, and I think it's important to remember as well that Liz Cheney said we can stand. She doesn't like Joe Biden, obviously. She's but she said we can stand four years of bad policies. We can't stand. We can't survive burning down the Constitution. No, and they've said they're going to. They're going to suspend. Donald Trump said it. Let's just suspend the Constitution for a couple of days. I, mm, I'd like to see how some of the conservatives who support him in the in in the Congress would say to that. The first time it's like we're we're moving to suspend the Constitution. What they would say? Who would stand? Who would sit? Who would say yay? Who would say nay? As long as they think they're going to be safe, they'll go along with it. Yeah. Right. But no one's truly safe. That's a very good point. Yeah. I think that's a very good point. All right. Moving on. Coming up at 1133, we're going to talk to Kip Adams about car deer collisions Mm -hmm. and what a serious problem this is, not just in Wisconsin, but all across the country. Correct. And there are some pretty shockingly high numbers that I was not aware of until we spotted this article. Mm -hmm. So if you have uh, questions for him or comments, 855-752-4842. Leave a comment on the live stream on Facebook, YouTube, and what used to be Twitter. I stumbled across this article over the weekend from Axios. They're called dumb phones, Greg. Dumb yeah. phones are making a comeback, <laughs> according to the New Yorker. It's it's a it's a it's a basically a flip phone that doesn't have the apps. 
It's a flip phone. It's a flip phone. Yeah. Essentially. So it's, you can't scroll on anything. You can't play any games. You can't. You just use the phone for its original purpose of a phone. It's not a dumb phone. That's, it's just a phone. Let's that's, just. That's what it says. A dumb yeah. phone is a basic 90s inspired cell phone without all the apps that contribute to high screen times, basically for texting and for calling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, I mean, I don't like to be like, ah, back in my day, because it wasn't really. My, I mean, we had like that. I remember I remember having a Sprint flip phone, and it was luxurious. I loved my flip it, phone. It was the first Sprint phone to have a camera on it. Ooh. I know. Oh, really that going back Half in a time. megapixel of power. But there is a growing number of people who are trying to break up with their smartphones. Yeah. Because we spend so much time scrolling on our screens. Is that something you would consider doing? Would you get rid of your smartphone and just go back to a phone phone? Mm -hmm. Take out the, take out the fact of whether you can or cannot like it. We understand there are some people who do need it, whether you are doctors, lawyers, people who are on call, we get that. But if you could, would you get rid of your phone and, and go back, to, go back to the old ways, text call only, right? No apps, no doom scrolling, no posting on the social meds, no tweeting, <laughs> no post an exing. You know, it, it, when I say it, I'm like, huh. You feel better, don't I you? I do. Right? We do. I do. I totally do. And again, because I'm because I'm the age I am, I didn't grow up with, you know, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have smartphones. Mm -hmm. We, You had to be home. If you wanted to get a phone call, you had to be home. And, and so even when I got into my 20s, I was very, very slow to adapt and get a cell phone and get a smartphone, but it's so much a fabric of our kids' lives. Yep. And in Manchester, Connecticut, the principal, Raymond Dolphin, of a middle school there two years ago, he, he said there was a problem. The kids aren't all right. And the problem was, a, was the cell phones. Yes. Students using their cell phones in class, even though there's rules that they can't. Social media making every conflict among students worse. Yes. The principal says when he walked the hallways or went into the cafeteria, all he saw was heads bent over screens. So we banned them. Good. Good. Not everybody was happy. Yeah. Not everyone was happy, at least initially, including parents who yeah. were complaining about not being able to get in touch with their kids. Well, this is, and I talked to you about this before we went on air. Uh, before I say that, we did get a text right away from uh, the 262 saying, no, I love my phone. I love it. That's it. <laughs> um, I'm not trying to take it away from no, you. No, no. No one's trying to take it away from you. We're not trying to take your phones or your guns. But when I was in school, and I'm, you know, I am like that generation almost between, like me and the millennials. I went to school, high school in the 90s. And if you had a cell phone, your father invented a number or your mother was a mathematician or you had a lot of money to have a phone. Uh, if you want to get a hold of your kid, you called the office. They called you and they said, hey, come to the office. And they or, said, or they brought you a note saying your mom called. She's picking you up early yes. because of such and such. They're not impossible ways. And don't act like the old ways are impossible because they're, they're still there. Phones are still they have landlines at schools. Still. Yeah. They yeah. do. Yes. Yeah. So here's how they worked at uh, at eight o'clock in the morning when the kids come in. They have to put them their phones into these individual pouches made of rubber. Mm -hmm. There's a magnetic lock at the top of the pouch. And then they put them in their backpacks until school is over at 245. Yeah. I mean, this is this is it says in the article, this is something that we're kind of getting used to with events too. There are comedians out there. If you go to a certain venues, they bring um these bags along and you have to put your phone in there and they store them. I mean, honestly, if I know that they're doing that, I'm leaving my phone in the car. Yeah. I don't, absolutely. I don't even really want my phone out of my hand, out of my possession like that. But yeah, I mean, there you go. And the results have been good. Yes. GMA Brown says she was really mad about it initially, but now she says I can focus more on classes. There are days when she actually forgets she has her phone on her. Yeah. And they're interacting more with each other. Yes. They're talking instead of at the cafeteria now, instead of everybody just eating their food and interacting with their mm -hmm. phone, mm -hmm. they're talking to other kids. Yeah. 
I don't know, in developing relationships and, and communication social, skills. Exactly. I, I Yeah, I don't think you need phones in the schools. I just don't. And that's, you know, I'm not a parent. I'm sure if there's a parent who wants to call and be like, you don't understand. You're absolutely right. I do not understand. But I also existed in a time before phones. So, Well, and just think about all of the bullying and the, oh. the terrible abuse that our kids are subjected to through their cell phones. So a little piece of confession from me. I grew up bullied pretty hard, especially first through eighth grade. Very Sorry. bad. Uh, not a fun time. Wouldn't go back if you paid me. Uh, kids I, are mean. Kids are mean and, and, and kids are sensitive too. I mean, we're just, we don't know anything. We have barely any memories in our brains. Uh, and high school was a little bit better, but I will tell you this. I would happily go back and redo 12 years of that world, then go through a year or two of what kids go through now, because it comes at you at all ends, physically, verbally, mentally, you can't get, you can't online. Get a, yeah, you can't get away from it. No, no, thank you. It is sounds horrifying to me. 855-752-4842 if you'd like to join the conversation. Cindy from Appleton. Good morning, Cindy. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. I wish they'd ban that stuff on the bus, too, because there's a bus driver there. A lot of that stuff these kids do on the phone is so disruptive on the bus. Mm -hmm. And kids are just bombarded with stuff anyway. What? It's wrong with, and, and I, I mean, a lot of the kids, unfortunately, have phones. Thankfully, some of them don't. kind of depends on their age range. But I just don't think kids need to be bombarded with all this stuff continuously. It's not good for them. It's not good for anybody to be continuously bombarded with advertisements, noise, texting, all that stuff. There's got to be a time where you get away from all that stuff. And people don't seem to do that anymore. And I just think you're missing out on so much other things. I mean, go take a walk and leave your phone at home, for God's sakes. And just listen to the birds, right? And just listen to the sounds. We're, we're coming up against a break, Cindy. Thank you so very much for calling. And as always, thank you for listening. I was just going to say, you could take the kids out of that and put the adults in there, too. Same thing applies. We yeah, could all use time away. Absolutely. Yeah. 855-752-4842. Stay close. You're listening to Matt Nair on air. This is the Civic Media Radio Network. It's Friday night, feeling real good, weekend in sight. Got a new phone, a new belt clip attached to my hip, even got the chip. Now everyone can Good, good morning, welcome me. back to Matt Nair on air. Jane Matt Nair, Greg Buck, Dr. Slide on the board. You can always join us. Call or text at 855-752-4842. Leave a comment on the live stream if you're watching on Facebook, YouTube, and the platform that Elon continues to actively ruin. Uh, we are talking about cell phones and more and more people... Going back to regular flip phones, trying yeah. to get away from the constant scrolling and the constant doom scrolling and all of the things we get sucked, all the rabbit holes we get sucked into on our phones. We had a comedian come through sometime last year and they were doing a joke where they asked the, an audience member to like, like either read off text messages or let them look at text messages. And he asked this like 19 year old kid, kid pulled out a flip phone and the whole room was like, Oh my God. Did they gasp. Yeah. And like, I'm sure there were younger people in there who are like, how do you do that? I'm sure there were older people in there, but there was a fair amount of us who were like, that sounds amazing <laughs> because I'm one of those people. I don't know about you, Jane, but I think you're in the same camp as me. I have to have a smartphone because I have to be accessible for work for both jobs. I don't love that fact, but it is part of the job I accept so going back to a flip phone would just be not impossible, improbable. It, and impractical. Exactly. As you said, there are certain certain professions where you just can't. Yeah. You, you, you probably just can't. And I get so much information from from the web and mm -hmm. unfortunately what used to be Twitter because that's still where I go quite a bit. Yeah. Um, but I am guilty of it as well as far as the doom scrolling and just getting sucked into it. Really, really interesting article called A Time We Never Knew. Yeah. It was printed, posted in After Babel, and the author is in, uh, Freya India. 
I have never heard of this. She, this is how she starts it. There's a beautiful and melancholic word I like. It's called enamoya. Mm-hmm. Enamoya is feeling nostalgic for a time or place one has never known. And she said, this is something I often get from my generation. She's Gen Z. I see it on old YouTube videos of proms from the 90s that get millions and millions of views. And she said, what's amazing to me about that is they didn't have phones. They had each other. Mm -hmm. They were talking to one another. They were looking out for one another. They interacted with one another Instead we, of this one-way interaction with your phone. Yeah. You you get home and you call your friend after school and you might even spend two hours on the phone with them, but you just saw them for eight hours and like, there's something different about it. It's the, 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 the article is kind of heartbreaking. It really is. Yeah. She just talks about all the things that she feels that her generation is missing because they have been raised on phones. Mm-hmm. Going for bike rides, going to the park, going, you know, she said, I can't remember a time or she would have liked to have gone back through school without worrying about how many likes her post got. Yeah. Without worrying about the mean thing the boy said to her in a text. Yeah. Back in high school, you just worry about the mean thing they said about you to their other friend, but face to face. And there's, and the thing is, is like these young, these, these Gen Z are now starting to pine for other things as well, as far as what, you know, I grew up having, you know, you know, more of a base, like less streaming, the ability to not have to, you don't have to worry about spoilers. You have a, you don't have a phone or you have a very basic phone. The, the beginnings of the internet where it was basically like four websites and instant messenger. And that, that, that term on is beautiful. Because I think about those kids watching it saying they want that. And granted, I can go back and be like, hey, man, there's some questionable fashion choices and <laughs> some of the music wasn't great. But it makes me appreciate that I did grow up in that weird kind of straddling both. Exactly. Like, you know, telling, like, remembering my life without cell phones and with like 23 channels and a landline. But then telling my niece and nephew, yeah, when I was a kid, we didn't have any of this stuff. We didn't have an iPad. We didn't have a cell phone. We didn't have Netflix. And their eyes are like, what? Yeah, it hasn't always been here. So, and and I don't know if you want to read a couple of them, but there were comments. She read, she printed, the, the author of this piece printed some of the comments from these videos and they just rip your heart it, out. It's so sad. It, one, one of the quotes is the whole concept of a real childhood is completely out the window at this point in time, and that's extremely sad to me. By the way, I'm 15. Yeah. Born in 2003. I'm 20 years old. I wasn't even conceived at the time of this video. It leaves me feeling empty. My high school experience was nothing like this. It almost makes me angry because I've never had simple, straightforward interaction as seen in this video. Even looking at the people in the background, they're there. They're mm-hmm. completely present. They're not buried in their phones. Yeah. They are not witnessing what's happening through a little lens. Yeah. They're actually in the moment. So there's another one here. As someone who graduated in 2015, this looks like such a nice time. Not a phone inside people actually talking face to face. I wish I could have grown up in an era like that. Calvin, I- how old were you when you got your first cell your your first phone? Uh before I went to seventh grade. So 12 or 13 was it a smartphone or a flip phone for ease it, it was one of those ones with the keyboard that slid up yeah okay and then i got an iphone the end of eighth grade i think so i was 14 or going on 15 did and how how do you think what kind of exp, what kind of influence do you think that had or what kind of impact did that have on your on your high school years do you think it would have been more positive if you if you hadn't had it there was definitely some thing like internet stuff that happened, like not even necessarily to me, but bullying wise that happened at our school that wouldn't have happened without the internet. But at the same time, I feel like a lot of that stuff would have still happened. Just it would have been in a different forum. Oh, bully, bully, bullies have always been around and bullying has always been mm-hmm. a thing. But I think... I think the advent of texting and all the social media sites has made it infinitely worse. Because I mean, as you said, Greg, you can't get away from it. When I was a kid, uh, kids beat me up physically. 
What they do now is they make up Facebook accounts or not Facebook, but like Snapchat account, chat accounts and bully these kids through that. Yeah. And they're untraceable. And it's, yeah, I, we can't take the phones away. I don't want to take the phones away. I really don't like if you, but I think these, these articles, which will all be on the, the, the show notes, they make a good argument to say, all right, we can put the phones down for a little bit, put the phone upstairs on the charger and watch a movie or go for a walk or have call. call I don't know, like find a different phone and call your mom. I don't know, but like, <laughs> I, it's not impossible. It's absolutely not. Cause we existed before it and kids can exist without it too. And you can just take a moment, an hour or two of your day and just say, Hey, let's put it down. I'm going to turn I'm gonna, off. just, just for an hour. Exactly. Take a little break. It's possible. It is possible. All right. Thank you very much. It's the most old man I felt in a long time. <laughs> These kids don't understand before the internet. And don't get, don't walk on his lawn because he get really, really upset. It really about needs that. to actually need to be mowed today. I'm going to mow it today. All right. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about <laughs> deer and cars and where Wisconsin ranks in the number of deer car collisions, deer automobile collisions. It's a lot higher than you might think. Stay yeah. with us. News is next. You're listening to Matt Nair on air coming to you across the vast civic media radio network. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? One night while driving home, I stopped to use a roadside phone to call my wife and tell her I was headed back. When somewhere out of that mist and fog came a big deer running from a pack of dogs, and that deer ran right into the side of my Cadillac. Good morning and welcome back to Matt Nair on Air. Jane Matt Nair, Greg Buck, Calvin coming to you from our studio in downtown Waukesha. You can join the conversation. You can call or text at 855 75 Civic. 855-752-4842, or leave a comment on the live stream on Facebook, YouTube, and what used to be Twitter. Excited to have our next guest join us. I knew that we crashed into deer quite a lot in Wisconsin. I didn't realize we crashed into them quite this much. Uh, Kip Adams is joining us. He is with the National Deer Association. Thank you so much for joining us, Kip. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Um, Wisconsin ranks fifth. In this list that I saw in this article from CNN, as far as the number of car deer crashes um, coming, number one is West Virginia. It's one in 38. Montana's number two, a one in 53 chance. Pennsylvania, number three at one in 59. And Wisconsin and Michigan are tied with a one in 60 chance of hitting a deer. And a lot of these are fatalities or end up with, with deaths, right, Kip? They certainly can. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy to think that, you know, in many cases, deer are far more dangerous to us than uh, and a lot of other animals like alligators, rattlesnakes that, uh, that people think of being far more dangerous. Well, I guess one thing is the, the frequency with which we encounter them. Is that, is that one of the reasons why there's just so many of them? That's exactly it. And in the, your ranking there, you know, has to do with one, you have a lot of deer in your state and you have a lot of drivers. So uh, those two factors put together is, is what makes you uh, high on that list. But certainly the number of animals in a state that you have a chance to hit um, ups your odds a lot. And then the dangerous part comes from we tend to hit them going really fast. Well, and it's 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 a it's at dusk and it's at sunrise, right? It's the it's the, the kind of the twilight hours when they are most active, for one thing. That's exactly right. The, the way that they see, um, you know, they can do best at dawn and dusk being most active. Hence, we can't see that great then. So uh, we don't tend to see them until they're either right in front of us or uh, moving in front of us at a high rate of speed. But you are correct. Those are the two times a day that, that motorists are far more at risk of hitting a deer. I mean, I remember the the one time I've, I've been lucky living in the state. 
I've only had one interaction with a deer and that was on a family trip. And I remember being asleep and then immediately not being asleep <laughs> because the car came to a dead stop and we hit the deer and the deer went flying. My dad told me this. He said, he goes, the deer went flying and just sort of like got up and was like, all right, well, I'm done with that. I'm going to go off and just knock the whole front end of our car off. Wow. Yeah. That's, ugh, it's, I know so many people who've had encounters, like just cars destroyed by them. Oh, absolutely. I have a friend who was on a motorcycle and uh, the deer essentially tried to jump over the bike. That didn't go so well. And uh, that he was in a really serious crash. Um, so that's certainly another consideration of people yeah. who, are, who are on motorcycles. What what can we do about this, Kip? It's it's it, it, is it just part of life? We just have to deal with it. I mean, put bumpers, extra bumpers around our cars or something. Well, if you live in deer country, it is absolutely a part of life. Um, however, there are things that we can do, you know, to to make it a little bit safer for ourselves. And one is just knowing times of the day when they're most active, like you mentioned, dawn and dusk. Be extremely careful then, mm -hmm. as well as times of the year. Um, we hit more deer during the spring and fall than any other point. Spring is when fawns are hitting the ground. So uh, they tend to be a lot more active and they're closer to the roads. And then the fall of the year, you know, when it's their breeding season, they're uh, they're crossing roads a lot more. So as motorists, just knowing, hey, these are the higher risk times, then we can be a little bit more careful, maybe slow down a little more in those uh, low light situations. That can absolutely help us. Kip Adams is our guest. He's the chief conservation officer for the National Deer Association, talking about this article in uh, on CNN that talks about just the number of deer car collisions. And Wisconsin's right up there. We're at number five. But as it says too, forget about sharks and bears. It's it's deer that you should be worried about. Uh, John from Boaz is on the line. Good morning, John. Thank you so much for joining us. What did you want to say? Yeah, I would like to ask the professor if, what he thinks about deer whistles. And the good news is, Jane, is that we don't be hitting mooses up here in Wisconsin. So, it, well, certainly you'd rather, if you have to hit something, I guess, John, a, a deer is preferable over a moose. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and agree with that. <laughs> 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 Um, thank you for thank you for listening, John. What 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 about the deer whistles, Kip? What 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 are those? That's a great question. Deer whistles are, are little plastic devices that you can put used to be on your bumper. Mm -hmm. uh, they're made so as you're driving down the road, air flows through them. They're supposed to emit a really sharp whistle yeah. to scare deer away from the roads. People have sold millions of these. The reality of it is that they don't help at all. They don't. Um, <laughs> deer deer hair very similar to the one yeah. we do. Um, so the hearing range is really, really similar. So even if they heard one, they're not hearing those coming at them. They may hear them once the car goes by. Yeah. Um, but there is a there, there's and there's actually there's scientific studies looking at the use of those. Um, they're they they don't help at all. So don't don't waste your money on those and don't put those on and fool yourself thinking you know what this is helping me. That's that's what's going to protect you. I'm when I was thinking whistle, I'm thinking traditional, like maybe like a a, a whistle. That's what I thought of too. But now I can remember, yeah, those little those little black tubular things that you put on the front bumper and mm -hmm. just and they'd always fall off. They get knocked off the first thing. Yeah, it, <laughs> demystifying demystifying Dear all the, the 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 untruth. <laughs> Thank you, Kip. We appreciate that. Uh, around two point one million deer vehicle collisions happen every year, causing more than ten billion dollars. In economic losses, I can't imagine the insurance claims uh, for folks who have had more than one sure. encounter. And uh, every year, deer car collisions account for almost 60,000 human injuries and 440 deaths. That's yeah. And you know what? It's a, it's got to be a minimum number because there's a fair number of accidents where somebody apparently just swerved off the road where they can't find a deer. They don't know cause of accident or you know if the person died i'm sorry cause of death but there's a lot of those that it's surmised you know what they think that person swerved to miss a deer ended up wrecking in the process so one of the big things and i know this is hard jane so you know like do not swerve it's way better to hit that deer with the front of your car a, something that's built for impact than to swerve lose control of your vehicle and then roll it hit a tree hit an oncoming car or whatever so uh that's a big thing for them as you know 
I have a young daughter who, who drives now, and uh, we stress that all the time. I don't want you to hit a deer. Slow down. But at the end of the day, do not swerve sharply. To avoid to it. Right. It's going to be a lot worse. Well, and certainly if there's other traffic on the roadway mm -hmm. or traffic coming in the opposite direction, you could try to do the right thing and not hit the deer and then mm -hmm. crash into somebody else. I am guilty of this. I break for squirrels. I'm that terrible person <laughs> who does that. I mean, you can slow for squirrels. They're going to get out of your way. But I mean, this is a very, very valuable information for me because, you know, we, you know, you, Kip, you live in Georgia, correct? I live in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. So, oh, okay. uh, we're, we're pretty high in that, that deer list as well. Okay. So yeah, we're, we're both in deer country and mm -hmm. I've been seeing deer signs my entire life. And I, and I, while I pay attention to them, I don't think about them. So this information is like time of day, time of year, hit them, hit them head on. Don't try to swerve. Don't it's, it's they're good reminders. This is all good reminders and valuable. Well, not even reminders. This is information I didn't know as a driver for a long time. It's, I just don't, I just don't want to hit a deer. I know. But as Kip said too, it's better, it's better to take them yep. on than, than try and avoid it. 855-752-4842. Yeah. If you'd like to join us, Mark from Prairie Doucette. Good morning, Mark. Thanks for joining us. What did you want to say? Yeah, I was just remembering that back in, it must have been in the late 60s, my Aunt Peg actually hit a moose. And it didn't, and that's back when the cars were big. She had a big old, she had a big old station wagon at the time. And it didn't turn out well for the moose or for the car. I mean, the, you know, fortunately, she was not, she was not injured. And I've had a few deer in my driving career. And, and uh, I was thinking yesterday, I was, you know, driving down, you know, at a, uh, Actually, it was Highway 78 driving, you know, the speed limit, and, and a guy went flying by me on a motorcycle, and he must have been doing doing 80. And I go, I, I just had a vision of a deer, you know, because oh. it's getting close to fawning time, and I go, you're just dooming yourself, you know, that uh, because there's nothing you're going to be able to do if a deer comes out in front of you, you're going that fast. I mean, that uh, because I've heard of the motorcycle and deer crashes, and those are, you know, you know, more often than not, fatal for both parties. I yeah. mean, it is just, uh, but just slow down because it's getting cold, real close mm -hmm. to fawning time, and the does are going to be moving around that uh, as they want to do. Thank you so much, Mark. Excellent advice. Really appreciate it. Always appreciate you listening. Yeah, yeah. I drive. I mean, I drive here to the studio on the backcountry roads. And just as the sun is coming up, exactly. You're, so you're 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 up. You're right. A, a deer moving time. But I I drive the speed limit, Jane. Not like some of these other. Not crazy eighty-five people. miles an hour. Nope. Nope. Kip, is it true that they always? I always figure if I do see one that crosses the road, I assume there are going to be four more. Man, there, there's often case that there's multiple deer. Um, not necessarily, you know, exactly four. Might be two more with it. Might be six more with it. But where you see one cross, oftentimes there's at least one more there. So, uh, you know, keep your pee eyes peeled at what's behind it because just because one made it doesn't mean there's not another one coming. So if you see that one, slow down, yep. even if it has crossed the road. Slow down and be ready. And, and look to where it came from because more often than not, there's, like you said, there's going to be, they don't like to travel alone. I don't know what it is. They just, they want company. They want They're friends. social. Social yeah. animals. They're social. They want to be together. <laughs> Kip Adams is our guest. He is with the National Deer Association, and we're talking about the problem of deer car collisions. Wisconsin is number five in the country. West Virginia, Montana, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and then Wisconsin. We're kind of tied with Michigan. I'm, I mean, honestly, I'm surprised we're not first. I mean, that was just actually, Kip, I was saying to Jane, I was surprised that the National Deer Association wasn't in Wisconsin, too. What's, was, yeah, what's up with that? <laughs> well, we have a, we have a lot of members in Wisconsin yeah. and um, we actually work closely uh, with your DNR and yeah. we have uh, an NDA employee in Wisconsin. And it, uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, actually, so tell us, there. tell us about your group. What, 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 like, what is the what is your, your mission at the National Deer Association? Well, our mission is to ensure the future of wild deer, wildlife habitat, and hunting. So mm -hmm. we're a nonprofit uh, national wildlife conservation organization. Um, we teach people about deer. We teach people how to enhance habitat for deer. Um, our employee that's in Michigan works specifically to help hunt new hunters who maybe didn't hunt as a kid who want to learn now how to line them up with a mentor so that mm -hmm. they can go hunting, help manage your deer population. So uh, if folks are interested in deer, uh, we're, we're the group for them. I will make sure that your group's uh, mm. website is on the show notes today. Mm. Leads directly to your uh, site and take care of any questions you may have. I would think uh, having a mentor would make an enormous difference, Kip. If I, mm. if I, you know, if I am 
hunting curious and uh, rather than than go out alone, it yeah. would be great to have someone to go out with who can show you the ropes a little bit. Absolutely. You know, there's a lot of things like golf that if you want to try, you can buy a book, you can read videos and at least get started. Hunting can be very difficult. You know, you have a bow or a crossbow or a firearm, you know. So anyway, yeah, it's uh, having a mentor makes a huge difference. And uh, we recognize that and do all we can to help provide those for for aspiring new hunters. I, I couldn't even I couldn't imagine being new to hunting going. Yep, I'm gonna go up on my my own. I, <laughs> right, I would I get bet, up there, and be like, "This was a mistake," and I'm gonna drive back to Wisconsin and find someone who can well, help me out. But I bet there are people who do that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah and then you bring it down, and you got to bring it in by yourself. That's a whole other thing, mm. too, right? Yeah, exactly. Kip Adams, the Chief Conservation Officer with the National Deer Association. Thank you so very, very much, Kip. It's mm. been a really interesting discussion. Have a wonderful day. My pleasure. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, Kip. Stay with us. You're listening to Matt Nair on air, coming to you across the Civic Media Radio Network. The Lord knows when to teach you a lesson you never will forget. <laughs> now my Cadillac's a total wreck. I got hoof prints all over my back and dog bites on my toes and up my shins. <laughs> yeah, my wife's run off, my job is gone, and I'm here in the jailhouse all alone. And I know one thing I will never say again. Somebody get on out here quick, be sure to bring your gun. I got hound dogs nipping at my heels and Bambi's a wrecking my coop to be. Help, give me the police. Thank God for 911. I tell you one thing, from now on, roadkill is off my menu. At least from now on, I'll make sure it's dead, not just playing possum. <laughs> Venison stew. Huh. I'll take chicken noodle soup any day. <laughs> Barbecue's good too. And sausage? Hey, Jimmy Dean is my hero. Welcome back to Matt Nair on Air. Jane Matt Nair, Greg Box, Sweet Cal B, coming to you from our studio in downtown Waukesha. Call or text at 855 752 4842. Leave a comment on the live stream on Facebook, YouTube, and what used to be Twitter. We're going to do a little housekeeping for our last break. Unfortunately, sometimes as the show is going along, and especially when we have guests and things, I can't see all of the texts yeah. as they're coming in. Yeah. There's just too many. I'm watching. We're so. I'm watching too many things. Jane Matinair of <laughs> Matinair on Air. We are so popular. Oh, yeah. We just can't keep up with the barrage oh, of text messages. And we love the barrage. We love the barrage and the live stream comments. Yes, love, absolutely. All the live stream comments, too. That's a whole other the, party going on over there. We love the world you've created in, in, in the live stream. It's wonderful. It is. It's a happy place to be. Yeah. So. So uh, we were talking at the very beginning of the show about elections and how the co-chair now of the Republican National Committee uh, was on one of the local news shows on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, and he's all about, oh, vote early. I love voting early. You should all vote early. It's all good. Everything is good. And he was asked, well, Donald Trump says that that's all fraud and fraudulent and bad don't do that it should be same day voting only and uh he's like yeah no we're gonna continue to keep telling people to to vote know how that's gonna <laughs> how that circles or how they're how they're gonna square that circle but Liz from Sockville texted in it's so ridiculous anyone who has watched election results knows it can take days yeah because Laura Trump said over the weekend it should there should be no counting ballots after after midnight on election day. That's not how things work. No. I've been watching elections for decades, staying up with great political commentators like Tim Russert. May he rest in peace. Absolutely. Yes. And then Sam from Milwaukee texted in, amazing how they can set up a narrative for the elections in plain view. And this is referring to, we could have had early counting of ballots. Yes, we could have. And yet, we don't. Devin Lemahue. Yep. Republican. 
didn't want to pass that. So now this sets up the narrative. They can go back and say they were ballot dumps in the middle of the night. Blah, blah, blah. And and let's let's also not forget something. Let's. I want to inject a a, a a pinch of logic into this whole reasoning as far as like stop counting the ballots after midnight and all that stuff. Guess what? People who vote for you won't get counted either. It's not like those those ballots become magically liberal or liberalicious after midnight. <laughs> But but are there more people in one party who vote early? And and which and this is a legitimate question. We should ask Deb, Deb Cronmiller about this from the League of Women Voters. Mm-hmm. She will be coming so, on. So when when you vote in person, yeah, do those get counted first before the absentee ballots get counted? Because and, they because they can't start counting them until eight o'clock. As far as my knowledge goes, once the the polls are closed, they start counting. The ballots in the machine, and once they go through those, they start adding the ballots. The absentees. Yes, because they can. They can. They can. As far as I remember, it's been a while since I've been a part of this process, but you can press a button. It can calculate all the ta- all the all of the same day voting, and it'll spit out. It can. It'll. It'll put out that number, or at least store it. Mm-hmm. Then you start feeding in the ballots. Well, and that's where it would make a difference, depending upon who votes more often absentee. Correct. Their bot ballots, if they're going to do this midnight cutoff, yeah, are they going to be the ones most likely that are not going to get counted? Well, yeah, absolutely. The, the, yes, the ones that the ones that are absentee are going to get counted second. Yes, because they want to take care of the ones that are already in the machine. Um, but you know, hey, if Brian Shimming and his guys have their way, that could all change because they're about banking that vote, baby. Ban- yeah, bank the votes. Bank yeah. the. I just, I love it. I just, I, I, I love it. So, uh, yeah, I mean. Look, we're behind safe, accessible voting for all. You know my feeling. I don't think voter ID is a necessary thing, but that's a that's a fight for another day. When it, you know we we will always we're always going to talk about myvote.wi.gov. Yes. Go there, find out who your reps are, find out your polling place, find out if you are registered. Why are you saying it like that, Greg? Because I want to make sure you understand me. Find out if you are registered. You might be, and you might not be. Well, they do do purge is not necessarily the, always the right word, but they do look at the voting rolls. If you haven't voted in so many years, in four years, in, if you haven't voted in four years, you're going to get kicked off. Yep. And then if you want to vote yeah. that year, you might be surprised when you show up. Yep. There's criteria of if you haven't voted in four years and you haven't responded to any of their communications, Com- right. they will take you off the voter rolls and then you will have to re-register. Then there are some states we're just going through with their nefarious plans and throwing people off and you have to go back and that causes a lot of problems. So what we're just saying is you might have to re-register on the day of, if you don't look. So that's why we want you to do it now. Yeah. That's so, why we want you to, why we want you to check it now. And for anyone in your circle or your life who is thinking about not voting, tell them to listen to the show. Tell them to listen I to mean, the civic media radio network about why it's so important that we all take advantage of this and it's our right. It's our right. And it is important. And the, the number of people who voted in 2020 was huge, but it wasn't big enough. It was 62% of the pop of the voting population. And it was the most ever. Yeah. So we, we had need a long more. way to go. Yeah. A uh, really quick program note. If you are listening to on the radio, W I S S or W R C E news from the center or and Oshkosh air support and W R J N. If you listen to the Brewers game tonight, on your radio, not the live stream, of course, but the radio. The game has been pushed from 610 to 640, so just be mindful of that. Uh, we will stop programming before that, but the game will go on at 640. All right, thank you for that. Jack from Miramac is on the line. Hi, Jack. We just got a couple of minutes left. What did you want to say? I'll try to be quick. This is What you've been talking about is exactly why we need a federal law that states unequivocally and clearly every adult American citizen has the right to vote. Any law, regulation, or activity that fear, interferes with that right is null, void, and illegal. And this means and includes, but isn't limited to, egregious gerrymandering, ridiculously demanding ID, atrociously demanding mail, uh, mail-in or absentee ballot rules, like, for instance, uh, a wife can't in Wisconsin even yeah. hand in or legally mail her husband's ballot. Yeah. Um, uh, on or near site voter suppression tactics like the so called poll watchers who are armed, dressed in combat gear, et cetera, purging of tens of thousands of voter rolls. You should have 
individual voters can be challenged. That's not a problem, but it should be done individually, not thousands and thousands at a time. Jack, thank you so very much. We're we're really right up against the wall here. I really appreciate your comments, and I always appreciate you listening. Um, stay new, stay close. News is coming up next. Thank you, Greg and Calvin, and to our engineers. Without you, nothing works. Thank you all of you for calling and texting and listening. It means everything. I hope you find some joy today and you have the chance to share it. Keep it right here on the Civic Media Radio Network.